Welcome everybody. For those of you whom I have not met before, my name is Rachel Carowin and I'm in the International Communications Group and just recently moved down to the corporate office. I was up here so I'm getting an opportunity to become more involved with the WLD team down there. So I'm really excited about that and I am also very excited for the opportunity to introduce today's guest speaker Gay Gaddis. She is the CEO and founder of T3 and if you have not had an opportunity to work with T3 uh, they are a really great uh, partner with UPS. Our relationship with them goes back uh, for 11 years but they founded the company back in 1989 uh, and they are headquartered in Austin, Texas. So we appreciate her coming in from Texas to be part of today's event. Um, Gay has earned numerous awards throughout her career, not the least of which is Fast Company's Top 25 Women Business Builder and Inc. Magazine's uh, Top 10 Entrepreneurs of the Year. Her business savvy is just one of her many facets. She is also a writer. She is a regular contributor to uh, both Forbes and Fortune Magazine. Like many of us, she is a wife and mother, but uh, unlike many of us, she is also co-owner of a 900-acre working cattle ranch in Texas, uh, which I would imagine is pictured here in this mm -hmm. lovely picture. Yeah. Uh, in addition to tenacity, creativity, and grit, two words that come to mind for me uh, when I think of Gay are passion and enthusiasm, because uh, I really feel like she brings both of those attributes to every activity in which she chooses to invest herself in her time. So please join me in giving a warm Georgia welcome to this <laughs> Texas lady, Gay Gaddis. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Well, thank you all for taking some time this afternoon. I'm a short pre person here. Um, but thank you so much for taking some time this afternoon to hear a little of my story. And as I was going through this and thinking about what to say to you today, I wanted to make sure that I also embedded some things throughout that I have found to be lessons that I've learned uh, over the past years of my life, um, most of those as a president of an ad agency. But it's, uh, hopefully there will be some takeaways for you along the way that will be helpful in your own career and lives. So make sure I get this right. Okay, so here's what I always say. A lot of these stories are really a lot of BS. You know, it's, uh, they want to tell you about all the great things and how it's a life of roses and bluebirds. Well, it's not. And uh, there are definitely some bumps in the road. And I will tell you about a few of those because at the time they seemed really horrible. Uh, and gut-riching, but when you look back on them, they're the things that really made you have to dig down and figure out who, you're, who you are and what you really stand for. So this one isn't one of those stories. So here's our staff, the whole team. Uh, we have around 200 people now, um, and 100% of our development's done in-house. And the reason I talk about this so much is that a lot of the technology and what we are building is so complicated today that we have to hold it in-house at T3 so we can control it and make sure that we're delivering the cleanest product we can at all times. And the other thing I'm really proud of, and I think that's the current number, is that we've had 675 consecutive payrolls at T3. And you add up all the years and wow, that's a lot of payrolls, right? And I'm so proud of that because it's not just, yeah, we were able to cut the checks. It's thinking about, for me, at this point in my career, all the lives and all the families that we've affected by having a great place or at least trying to have a great place to work that employs people and gives them a livelihood and an opportunity to practice their trade, their craft, and get paid for it. Because um, like a lot of artists, you don't always get paid, and I'll tell you about that later. Um, so, so I say put yourself out there. That's a big phrase that I use a lot. And um, what I mean by that is if you don't, Get yourself out there, sometimes out of your comfort zone, you miss out on a lot of stuff. And uh, I've had a 
history of doing that. My mother always made me do it. By the, by the time I was three years old, I was dancing in a little blue tutu across the stage in Liberty, Texas. You know, you would have thought we were on Broadway, but it was a town of 9,000 people, and I didn't know, so I thought it was great. But she always made me kind of put myself out there, be out among people, and really learning and getting to know people along the way. So why do we have these offices? Well, you know that Austin's our home base, and I laugh about Austin because when I started the company in 89, I had to tell people, don't worry, I apologize a little bit, we're from Austin, but we can do great work, I promise. And now, everyone wants to come to Austin. It's kind of turned into this cool place, and uh, what a lot of you probably don't know is along the way, I did live in Atlanta for two years back in 1980-82, and had a great experience here, so Atlanta's very fond of my heart. So. The second office we open, though, is up here in a little, little town called New York City. And uh, the reason we did that is at the time, this was right after 9-11, we were placing a ton of digital media for Dell and a few other companies. And so we couldn't find anyone in Texas who knew how to place and plan digital ads. Uh, there just wasn't a market for it there, and the publishers were all in New York or on the coast. So we opened an office in New York. and found a great group of people and we had a media office and it soon turned into creative and became a nice hub for us. The other thing is the San Francisco office was proximity to Microsoft and again talent that we could get out there that people just want to live in San Francisco, they don't want to live anywhere else and there's some great people out there near Silicon Valley. And then last but not least, we opened this office in Atlanta and I'd been wanting to do this for a while but it all worked out and uh, we started doing some more work with companies in Atlanta. This is a great place to do business. And of course, our UPS relationship is like uh, everyone has said, around 11 years old now. And so it's been great to have some of our team here on campus with you. So here are some of our clients. So you kind of see the company we keep. And uh, we get to do some really great work for some great clients. The nice thing that I have to tell you is because we're independent, uh, and no, I, no one owns us, I only, we only work for our clients. That's what I say, the only ones who have a piece of us are our clients. And so we can choose who we want to work with, which is such a pleasure and such a joy that I realized over the past few years because some of the people that we recruit to T3 say, oh my gosh, I worked at XYZ agency and we didn't have a choice because all the profits were going up and we had to work on whatever they told us. So we like it when we can say, you know what? We choose these people and they choose us and, and that's exciting. So we already heard about this, but I am a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a writer, I'm a mentor, I'm a rancher, I'm a public company board member and a speaker, artist, and our author. And if I have time, I'll tell you about my art career because that's a, a big surprise for me down the road. Um, so here, here's kind of the logos. Uh, I have on this ranch brand today. It goes back 160 years in Texas, and we have a little time after all this, and anyone wants to hear the story, I'll tell you. It really is a, a true story of a Texas love affair that went back in my family. Uh, and I do write for Forbes and Fortune. Uh, the board of directors I'm on is Monotype. Uh, we own and license and develop typefaces. Uh, we own everything from like Helvetica, Bononi, and then do the entry level on your car. Like most of you, if you have a digital screen in your car, Monotype digitizes type for <coughs> devices and that sort of thing. So it's a fun company to be involved in. Um, oh, and I didn't say the Committee of 200, but I've been a, a member of that. And actually, Kate Gutman is a Committee of 200 member here at UPS, and I was excited when she joined. It's a, it's a great women's group that I've had the privilege of being a part of. Um, so here's my story, and that's me, uh, a little girl in Liberty, Texas, and my parents were from Missouri. And so I was born in Texas, so I'm a real Texan, but they just thought Texas stuff was cool. So they dressed me up from the time I was a little kid in these cowgirl outfits, and I kind of became a little cowgirl and rode horses and uh, learned how to, to barrel race a little bit. But my mom never would let me be in the rodeos because she didn't want me hanging out with all those pesky cowboys. So I didn't get to really compete, but I wanted to. But I always say success is not a straight line. Uh, it goes this way, that way, up, down, whoop, way over here. Sometimes you leap way beyond what you think. But it's never a straight line. You can't map it out like we'd like to. And we like our lives to be perfect and say, well, this will be the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. But it doesn't work that way. So I learned a long time ago when I lived here in Atlanta who I was. I didn't know it from the beginning. 
My very first job out of college, I was an art major, was to work at a small, at the time it was a small advertising agency called the Richards Group in Dallas. And I was a dismal failure there. I worked there for a year. And I couldn't believe it because I, I was a magna cum laude graduate from University of Texas. I'd been very successful with my classes there. And I got in that situation and couldn't figure out what was going on with me. Uh, I ended up going to Baylor Medical Center and got promoted very quickly to be the public relations director. And the reason I'm telling you this is this is going to come into the rest of my story later. But I did find out when I lived in Atlanta who I was for the first time. These guys that I worked with here all had gotten their MBAs at Harvard together. And so I was working with them as a marketing director and our job was to go out to major companies like UPS, like Coca-Cola, Delta, and P&G and do team building sessions and leadership training, strategic planning, all the stuff that they kind of had under their belt in Harvard. But what, how they did that was they tested everybody in these rooms. And so we either had to take the DISC test or the Myers-Briggs. How many of you all have taken one of those tests in this room? Yeah, so you know, it's great. Um, I didn't know at age 24 what was in my brain and I found out. Uh, and I learned what I wasn't good at and what I was good at. And that became the secret to my life almost. It, it was so wonderful to realize it's okay to not be good at details. I'll let somebody else do that. I'll find someone who's better at that than me. Uh, but I'm an ENTP, and there's the ENT brain, if you would have uh, uh, looking around. So we dive down, Very, we love puns and jokes, the lowest form of humor, you know. Uh, I like... Uh, Incredible bullshit, it's pretty good, right? Interesting <laughs> projects and ideas, narcissistic thoughts hiding down here. Ooh, yeah, probably true. And then somewhere up there, oh yeah, alcohol and coffee. I've self-medicated for years and I finally figure out what it was. So it's really fantastic. <laughs> anyway, so I always say, if you know who you are and you know how to surround yourself with people who do the things better than you, you will be surprised how great your teams will function and how great your careers will be. Okay, so, when I got back to Austin, Texas, this is in 1982, after having this wonderful opportunity here in Atlanta with the Harvard guys, uh, my uh, first husband at the time got an opportunity to come back to Austin to be a part of an orthodontic practice, and the offer was too good to pass up. But for me, going back to Austin in 1982 was a career killer. It was like the last place I wanted to go. So, you know, there I was, I found the only ad agency in town, you know, that was really hiring anybody, and they really weren't hiring. Uh, it wasn't a great time, but they thought I was smart or something, and they just said, just go sit over there and figure out what you can do. Well, my first account, right off the bat, was the Burnham Brothers, and the Burnham Brothers were famous all over for their coyote calls, uh, doe and rut scent. You know what that is? That's you know, okay. Uh, <laughs> and so it's all these stuff that hunters buy, right? And they're like famous for this stuff. And so look at their terrible ads. I mean, my God, I had, my taste level was so high up. And this is what they were doing. And I was told I had to go do their catalog. And we had less than three weeks to pull off the whole thing. Well, it was just a joke. But I did. And uh, but what, during all of this, I learned a lot about the ad business. Because you see, I would gotten out of it and was doing all these other things. But I was back in the ad business and I decided if I'm going to be in this business, I better understand how the money works. So I sat down at the feet of the old guy who started the business and on yellow notepads, he taught me the agency business. And he taught me where to make a profit, how much to charge, what your overhead looked like, uh, how to manage the ratios and all this stuff. And so I became a student of how to make money in the ad business, and I did, and I loved it. It became the time that I, I began to love the business. Well, then I found out something else, and here's one of the phrases I use a lot. Competence leads to confidence that then leads to assertiveness. There's no point in saying, I'm going to go and just bulldog through this and be assertive if I don't really have the competency to do it. you got to know your stuff. You know, and you got to learn about it and be good at it. And then you can be more confident, and that gives you the courage to be more assertive sometimes. So one of the things I found out is because of my Baylor Medical Center experience, I became one of the top two, maybe the top person in the state of Texas who understood healthcare marketing. And back in the 80s, that was a big deal, especially when the recession hit in 87, 88, and so many companies were just tanking, and uh, the company I was working for was having difficulty. But I had gained enough 
competency around the healthcare business that I had a book of healthcare accounts and they were profitable and they were paying the bills. So that was a really exciting thing that I thought, well, you know, I do know something. The reason there is a yellow submarine up here is it became so competitive in the state of Texas. This is a, a there's a little town called Tyler, Texas in East Texas. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but they had two really great medical centers there. We work for East Texas Medical Center headed up by Elmer Ellis. And the other hospital was Mother Francis, uh, headed up by a man named Lindsay. Can't remember his last name. But anyway, Lindsay. So the joke around town was, if Elmer gets a, a yellow submarine and puts it out in the front yard of East Texas, Lindsay will have his out there next week. So it was that kind of competition. So we had two. It was really fun. So if you're working for one of them, you wanted to make sure they were competitive. So it kept us on our toes all the time. Um, so. I was growing this great book of business. I told you we had a terrible recession going on. Texas was the worst uh, of almost any state. We were all bad. But uh, our real estate wasn't worth the dirt it was built on, and all the savings and loans failed. So Texas was on its knees. It was a really bad time. And I decided to come up with this business plan to turn around this agency I was in. And I thought it was great, and everybody loved it except for one person. And that was the president, and he decided he was not going to support my initiatives, my plan, or anything. So I was rejected, but I listened to my gut, and your gut is rarely wrong. Don't let your head take over sometimes. The biggest mistakes I have made in my life is when I let that ENTP logic part of my brain tell me what to do when I knew my gut was telling me it was wrong. And I follow my gut, and the older I get, the more I go with the gut, because I can work out a lot of logical reasons why all these things should work and shouldn't work, but if your gut says no, then walk away from it. As we tell our border collies, leave it. And they do. They love that command. Just leave it. God, it's hard for them sometimes. So when they're chasing a squirrel or they're trying to herd a goat, and you say, leave it, they kind of go, mm, okay. They also go, yeah, they learn it, and it, it makes them grow. Okay, so I walked in his office and I quit. I mean, just total, talk about knee-jerk reaction. You know, he'd walked into my office and told me he wasn't going to support my plan. And so I just sat there and fumed for about 30 minutes, called my husband, was outraged, almost cried, but I don't cry much. And so I was so mad, I just ran down to his office and I said, guess what? I quit. And I said, if I can't do this here, I'm just going to go do it someplace else. And he thought that I was going to probably go work for somebody, but who was I going to go work for? There weren't any jobs. <laughs> so I, I quickly decided, well, guess I, I quit. I can't take that back now. So I guess I'm going to have to open my own office and do this. Well, I did. And whoop, let me go back to this one. So this is all I had, literally, a typewriter, a telephone, and this wonderful woman allowed me to rent a 1,000 square feet in her little office space. And I didn't have anything to prove I could pay it but she believed in me, but I did have this. The one thing I did, because I had expertise in the healthcare industry, I had three really great accounts, and there were actually a few others, but three that were just solid with me. Now, there were very few non-competes back then, and so I could have walked out the door with those three accounts and never looked back. However, Austin was a small town, and I didn't want to be known as that bitch who took off and stole their three accounts that were making money. So I negotiated with them a buyout of those. And so I bought the accounts from them over a period of a few years. And I could walk out with my head up and didn't feel like that I had ripped them off and, and we were somewhat peace. Um, so anyway, I started the agency, 1989. There I was, you know, sitting there, what we call now the Miami Vice table. It was a big turquoise ta table, and that's what was my furniture with a couple chairs and a typewriter and a telephone. And I didn't even have a fax machine but that we made do and borrowed someone else's. So soon after I started the agency, my husband, who can goad me like nobody else, said, well, what are you going to do with this little agency in Austin, Texas? The last thing the world needs is another small agency in a recession struggling along in Austin, Texas. What are you going to do to differentiate yourself? I said, well, Lee, you know what was in the business plan. It was all about awesome, breakthrough creative that is measured and managed, and we know the science behind it, and we know what works and doesn't. We're going to measure everything. And he said, well, great, that's very lofty of you. Uh, and he asked me again, so I had another glass of wine, 
<laughs> and uh, and I went into some diatribe, somewhat like what I just had said about the science and the art and the creative and the awards and all that stuff. So finally, he said, "This just not it." So I said, well, damn it, we're going to do kick-ass work for clients who want to kick ass. He said, that's it. He said, that's your business plan. So he ran up, got a napkin at the bar, and wrote it down, and it still hangs in T3 today. And that's what we're all about. You know, we want to do that kind of work. We want to do work that gets attention, that works, and it's for clients who want to make big, exciting strides. And they want results, and they want things to work. So that's become our mantra all these years. And it's also been kind of an interesting thing to be able to do what we wanted to do. So I always laugh and say, this year, the year 22 years ago, when I had four moms who got pregnant, literally within a few weeks of each other, I look back now and say, was there an ice storm that went on there? <laughs> like, what happened? But I, I realized that, guess what? We didn't have to do what everybody else did. We could do what we wanted. So I said, why don't you just bring the kids up here? Just bring the babies to work. I don't care. We'll take care of them. They went, oh, no, it's horrible. I didn't. We can't do that. No one had ever heard of it. So we did. And we eventually convinced all four of these moms to bring their little babies up there after their maternity leave. And we all took care of them until they were about nine months old. And then they all decided they could get a nanny and some shared and one of the others went to daycare. But it helped those moms segue between that gut-wrenching, uh, I'm not quite ready to leave my baby yet, you know, to being able to get back in the workforce without losing a beat. So we did it. And today, 22 years later, we've had over 100 babies who have come through this program. We have loved them. We have adored them. And sometimes they cry and they do little poopy stuff and all that, but we just deal with it, right? Because <laughs> that's what babies do. They sleep and cry and eat and poop. So that's it. Uh, but they're so darling. And I do think that we've had an incredible, really real-time experiment on child development. And I am about to join up with some other childhood, early childhood development folks and prove out some of this stuff that we've never really scientifically studied. But I believe that since the children, the little babies, are in the office and they are listening to adults having conversations, they're in meetings, they're listening to language early, early. And all of our kids seem to do really well in school. And maybe they aren't the top scholar, but they're, you know, like the mayor of the kindergarten class, or they have a lot of skills, you know? <laughs> so uh, I just love what we, we, yes, we follow these kids. Like uh, Jill Runyon, who runs the EPS business for us, had her daughter Lake in the New York office, and Lake is just like in control. She's wild. She's, <laughs> she's one of our T3 and under babies that's just really smart and uh, very assertive and very confident little girl. Oh, and by the way, these two were the first two babies in the program. And they walked in our office last summer and surprised me because they were both interns. And they won the opportunity to be an intern at T3. And so their life comes full circle, right? So I've always believed, you know, I grew up on farms and ranches or near them. My husband did. And um, I really am kind of an old cowgirl at heart. Um, I still ride horses. And, um, but this was my great-grandfather bailing hay back in the old, old days. And we did a little uh, better equipment these days <laughs> at our ranch. But um, I've always believed that you, you let your children, you let your families know what's going on with you. You know, you don't want to hide everything that's going on at work. If mommy or daddy had a bad day, well, you can maybe tell them a little bit about it because then they don't feel bad that it was their fault. Because, you know, kids kind of absorb your feelings and start to think that, wow, mom doesn't seem really happy today. I wonder if I did something. You know, so you tell them a little bit. You also share the good stuff with them. And uh, one of the things that we laugh about is we've got one of our uh, senior women at T3, and she tells her kids, she's got, look, I've got a killer week. And it's, I'm not going to be here and have babysitters most of the week. But when I get through this, we'll do something fun. They all go get ice cream. They celebrate. They go someplace and, and do that. So she's trying to involve her children in that. And I really believe that we live life like a family farm in a lot of ways. Well, in a family farm, there are sometimes you just have to drop everything and go do something. You know, the bull just got out and ran through someone's, you know, fence. You got to go deal with it. You know, the rattlesnake is crawling in the back porch and you better kill it or do something. And, uh, you know, so all the stuff that goes on on a farm or in a ranch is it's like the immediacy of life and you got to take care of stuff. So that's how work and life is to me. Uh, I th see it all the same. Hello, my name is Scott Reynolds. Welcome to Discovering the Internet. In this tutorial, we'll take a look at the differences between the Internet and the World Wide Web. 
the differences between commercial online services such as the Microsoft Network, Prodigy, or America Online, and the Internet. How to get connected to the web. How to use something called a web browser to navigate the web. What a web page is. And how to search, locate, and download all types of files. <laughs> okay, can you believe that? So, you know, there we were in Austin, Texas, as this thing called the internet was being discovered. And this is the early 90s. And one day I got a call from a friend of mine who I was a close friend with, but this guy who I'd known at the University of Texas who was working at Dell. And he said, we're having all kinds of problems with our databases. Our direct mail sucks. You've got to come out here and see what you can do. And we're, we were not going to use our in-house agency for everything anymore. So we bundled up and ran to Dell, and one thing led to another. It literally was the elephant that walked in the room for us. Uh, here we were, a fairly small agency, and uh, here comes Dell. So the internet was so unknown at the time, and we didn't really know anything about it, but the good news is nobody else did either. <laughs> so we jumped in this, and before all that though, we were doing all this work for Dell. We did catalogs. We did 12 million catalogs a month with sometimes up to 40 different versions. We went to every small business address we could find in the United States. And so it was an incredible process that we did. But we did tons of direct mail, we did all this stuff, and then again, here came the internet. And so we had a real trusted partnership with Dell. And we were doing, you know, starting to do some online ads, and we did a few little things here and there. And I told you the New York office came about because of media. But Michael really stepped out there. And these are back in the days when I met with Michael on a fairly regular basis, believe it or not. It was, we were all young then. And uh, so Michael stepped up and said, guess what? We can sell iron on the internet. That's what we always used to call it. We're going to sell these computers to sell the iron on the internet. Uh, and he said, I think it perfectly fits our direct model. So we ran back and we started working with Dell day in, day out to come up with all this stuff. And guess what? My business plan, the reality of being able to measure something became a complete open door for the first time. We had always measured things before through media, through engagement, through direct response, all that stuff. But the internet was the key to real engagement measurement for the first time. And I love it. So we had a great relationship with Dell for 16 years. We helped build some of the first online uh, programs in the country. And it was a great run until one day they hired a new CMO and his number two guy, and they decided to consolidate agencies across the world. They claimed there were 800 some odd agencies worldwide for, uh, for Dell, and they wanted to get it down to one big holding company that would own the whole thing. So they hired WPP. They told us we were the only thing not broken in the whole system, because at this point we were doing the entire small medium business, everything for small medium business. It was all the online, it was television, it was promotions, it was catalogs, it was everything. Um, and so we thought, okay, well, we're going to stay around. Then they told us, as the thing went on, that the only way we were going to stay is if we sold a WPP. So that's Dr. Uh, Sir Martin Sorrell, who's the head of WPP. And they walked in my office really very fiercely on a February the 14th, 2008. I call it the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And they walked in and shoved a piece of paper across this table at me and said, you're going to have to sell the company or else. Well, they thought they had me over a barrel because unfortunately and fortunately, the elephant had grown to over 50% of our business, which is not a good thing. You never want a client that's over 50% of your business, but Dell just kept growing. As much as I would try to grow the other business around it, I couldn't keep up with it. It was just like that big of a tiger by the tail. So we told them no. And that day I walked away from $70 million worth of revenue and a whole staff of people going, what is gonna happen? So we drug them outside, we all had this big meeting, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, but everyone understood why I didn't want to sell the company. And so I said, we're going to do the best job anybody's ever done taking this thing out, we'll take our 90 day out clause and we'll be flawless, and we were. But their grand experiment became one of the greatest failures in the history of advertising. They tried to start this thing called Infatico and it did not work. Uh, we knew it wouldn't, and I think they knew if we had stayed in, we would have made it work. But it was good news in a way. Because what happened to me? Well, 
Uh, one little thing happened is our youngest son went off to the university, and with my other two, I was crying the last day of summer as we were driving them off to school. Uh, when the youngest one came along, the minute he graduated, I said, can you move in the apartment now? Uh, I need to go. I've got to leave. I've got to do a lot of speaking and stuff. And so why don't you just move on out this summer? <laughs> so he was out. <laughs> um, and uh, I took off, and I flown over almost 5 million miles on American Airlines, and I know Delta's the uh, airline of choice here in Atlanta, and I love Delta too, but I had to stick with somebody, and, and they're based out of Texas and home to Dallas. So I took off, and when the brass ring started coming around, I grabbed for it. And uh, because we had this experience with internet marketing that hardly anyone had, and everyone was trying to figure it out, right? So we got into Chase. We had an 11 year relationship with Chase. We did all of corporate Marriott across all their brands. Uh, we worked with Microsoft and on and on. Just big clients came our way. And we knew that we could scale because we'd done it with Dell. So it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me when I had to sell out of that box and say, get out of just doing too much work for Dell. So along the way, we had this little opportunity with UPS, and I mean little. I want to tell the story real quick. How am I doing on time, by the way? We good? Yeah, okay, just keep me honest on this. I'll talk all day. Uh, but anyway, um, I was on a bus at a supplier diversity uh, event, and this was about 12 years ago, and I was at the event because I'm a woman-owned business, and I support WeBank and some of the minority-owned business company events as well. And um, there I was on this bus with this woman I didn't know, and it turned out she was from UPS, and she, uh, she started talking to me about how when, they, when UPS would go to some of these events, she didn't really feel like she was getting the traction she wanted. She wasn't sign up, signing up enough accounts with small businesses, and she was kind of stumped on, what could we do? And I said, Sharon, let's come up with some stuff. Let, let me just brainstorm with my team, and we'll come see you. So she let us in, we got in the door, and this was the first project we did for UPS. So what it was, was we decided that the worst thing that can happen to women at these trade shows and events is traipsing up and down the concrete floors with those thin little you know carpets that would do about as much good as a piece of tin foil you know and uh, wearing heels like this you know and your legs hurt so bad at the end of the day you're about to scream so we decided what if we had these little brown slippers and we could put a pink UPS on it. Well, oh my God, getting that done was an act of Congress to not use the gold. I mean, it was like, we had to go to the mat for that, but we said, no, 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 we gotta do pink, we gotta do pink. So we did, and we did these little shoes, and if you would come by the booth, the UPS booth, and sign up for an account and chat within a minute, you got a pair of slippers. And that's how this whole thing started. And back in those days, too, a lot of people read newspapers. <laughs> um, now people do it online, but we did belly bands at the hotel, uh, with the slipper, get, come get the slipper, come by the booth. Oh, it was a roaring success. And the reason we knew it was such a big success is the last day of the conference, there were three women on a panel up on the stage, and one of the women had on her UPS slippers and announced to the entire audience of almost a thousand people how fantastic it was. So, <laughs> so it was a great success, and it was our opportunity to walk in the door at UPS. So sometimes what I say is that Big things come in small packages, and you know we we love the idea of doing anything for UPS. It was such an exciting opportunity for us that we were willing to start small and just kind of take it as it came along. And so that's what's been going on for the past almost uh, 11 years now. So we do a lot of really complex things. This is a UPS diagram. Like all this stuff is going on at the same time, and we call it a touch map because all these things have to coordinate in real time. So how does this get done? It gets done with very smart, interesting, diverse teams. And when I say diverse, I mean in all ways. It's uh, ethnicity, it is gender, it is type. Like I told you earlier about me being an ENTP, and I don't want a bunch of ENTPs in the room with me. I mean, we'll all sit there and laugh and think each other's hilarious, but we won't get a damn thing done. And so uh, I've got to have other folks around me, and I know that. So diversity of team is what really is I'm jazzed about these days. And I think you talk about innovation. High innovation comes from diverse teams getting together and really walking the walk and doing some cool ideation. That's what I believe. So. I'm going to say this, um, what, is, what is really the thing, and I'm going to go back to teams in a big way here in a minute, there's a last part of this, but this is something I just wanted to show you because along the way, we decided sometimes, I mean, we've always made a profit, thank God, every year, knock on wood, 
Um, but um, a lot of times, because, again, we're independent, we decide to invest in ourselves. And I'll say, guess what? We have an opportunity to get these great people. Yeah, it's going to cost us money, but I'd rather invest in them than me just take a few more dollars in profit or sharing it. I'd rather have new people. So we hired the best people. We built a video capability years ago before anyone thought it could do anything. And it's been just a fabulous part of our services and made us easier to ideate and now create some beautiful stuff that I just saw a video done for our film for our UPS recently that was fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it's beautiful. But it all comes from that background that we invested in this years ago. Um, we built our own mobile expertise before people even thought anything was going to happen. And I'm very proud that we were part of the team that worked on UPS My Choice. I mean, that all came from mobile exploration around the globe to find out what could be done with the techniques and with the um, services and with the capabilities you already had. Uh, we invested in strategic talent. You know, at one point, we didn't really have what I would call planners in our business. Uh, I expected everybody to be thinking about the business all the time, because T3 stands for the think tank, and TTT, the think tank, T3, is all about people, you know, really coming forward and thinking about the business that we're involved in, of our clients' business. But we decided to hire some very strategic folks who that's what, the, how, that's what they do for a living, so digital strategists and strategists. Uh, we spanned our technology bench, and I, like I said, it's all in-house, and that means we have to hire all kinds of people with all kinds of talents to be able to support the, the different systems that we run on. And so there's more software engineers than I would have ever believed in one building, and uh, it's pretty exciting, but it's all done in-house, and we developed that group. Uh, we built our social practice before anyone even thought it was going to go anywhere. We did social for uh, J.C. Penney years ago. And one of my cousins, who used to work there, would go out to Cindy Crawford's house in L.A., and we did early chats with Cindy. And so Katie would sit there and do all the typing and do all the words, and Cindy would just tell her what to say. But, I mean, we were really kind of delving into social before anyone could ever say, well, how do you monetize that? You know, what does is is engagement levels mean? And we started being able to prove that we could find uh, intent to purchase and, and involvement just because of engagement times. And we added user experience expertise. I didn't even know what that was a few years ago. What's a user experience? Well, it's key. I mean, you know, it's like everything we put out online, does that really, or on mobile and social, how's the user feel about it? What kind of experience do you have? And we built a loyalty offering, and we just launched one for Pizza Hut that's one of the most complicated ones in the world. <laughs> and it worked, and it, we did it, and we celebrated last week. So talent is everything. And I'm very proud to say that here's little bitty T3 sitting here in the top five most innovative agencies in the country based on Forrester's research. And we pay attention to Forrester. They pay a lot of attention to all of our industries. And um, we're very, very excited. And um, they said things like, we like this firm's think tank approach to customer experience. Um, it builds in opportunities for paid and earned channel planning and applies actual industry expert insights. So we're really excited that our talent paid off. And uh, it's really been a great thing to be in company with some of these huge companies out there. So we we're watch, back watch with this. an update. January 30th, T3's automated trading platform worked again, bigly. The president got all over Delta Airlines. Our bot spotted it, flagged it as negative, and shorted it all within seconds. So when the stock tanked, we closed our short. And our return? Big profit. Right to the puppies. Sentiment analysis, complex algorithms, real-time stock trades, all fully automated by the T3 Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Stay tuned for our next short. Okay, I showed you that not because it's political, it's not. It has nothing to do with whether anyone voted for Trump or did or likes him or doesn't, this, that's not the point. This was an idea that came out of our New York office and they said, have you noticed that when Trump tweets, company stock goes up and down based on his sentiment? And so we turned it over to the software engineers and said, what could you do with this? And they prototyped this thing in five days and had it up and running, and we could really do this. And so it, within nanoseconds of his tweet, we can go into a stock purchase or, or buy. And so all the money goes to the ASPCA, T3 didn't make any money. And the whole point of it was not really to make money. It was just to see if we could do it. 
And so this is what kind of goes on in think tank sessions a lot. And at T3 and our innovation teams is we say, wow, can we do that? And we even hacked into Tinder one time and did something that they didn't like, but, but we proved we could do it. <laughs> and, uh, and they just they basically sent us a letter that said cease and desist, and we did. And we didn't hurt them, but it was kind of interesting to see that we could get in there and, and figure out sentiment based on your heartbeat. Isn't that cool? Isn't that fun? Um, so anyway, so here's a little bit of what I've learned. We're going to kind of sum this up a bit. I started writing a book about oh, almost two years ago. And I'm going to give you the name of it. It's coming out in January of 2018. And the name of it is Cowgirl Power. That's why I mentioned being a cowgirl a good bit, and I love cowgirls. Uh, it's a book for men and women, but I'm gonna tell you, it's a little slanted to women. You gotta pick a you know, niche, and I am a woman. But uh, I love the fact that uh, it's got good advice in it. And the thing that came so clear to me as I was working on this and researching the book was what's going on with these high-performance teams. And it's what I was mentioning a few minutes ago. So. This was in the New York Times, and I'm just going to read it to you, but a new science of effective teamwork is vital, not only because teams do so many important things in society, but also because so many teams operate over long periods of time, confronting an ever-widening array of tasks and problems that may be too much different from the ones they were initially concerned you know, involved to solve. And so I think we find this a lot, uh, your teams. And once you start on a path, the problems that you have to solve may change three or four times because technology is changing, because the industry is changing, customers are changing. And so you know that's why these teams have to morph and move together and be trusted partners with each other. So we see it from us being partners with you, with you internally, and how you work on these teams. Um, so T3 kind of did this instinctively for years, and I realized it when I started seeing what was the discourse was about teams. So my statement is that culture beats strategy every time. Yeah, strategy um, is great, and we all need strategies, and we live by them. Um, but I believe that some of these things, like the baby program, but ideation sessions, this is part of culture, this is work, but it's fun. And we try to set it up so teams can really come together and give their best thinking and, and feel trusted and someone's not going to pot shot. You know, it's like no idea is bad to begin with. You know, let's get it out there. Let's put it up on sticky notes and we can come back to it later and decide, well, maybe that could work this way or that. Um, and then we do fun stuff and we dress up and we have meals together on the 4th of July. We're not working on the 4th of July, but we have 4th of July dinner. And uh, just do a lot of fun. And we have dogs. And look, this dog is a UPS package deliverer. <laughs> so he's dressed up for the uh, Halloween party. Uh, we were having a staff meeting the other day and our UPS driver, who we all love, came racing up to the door and we all clapped and he went like this and then ran out of the room and it was really cute. But um, yeah. So I also believe, let me give my little nod to the women's story here. Thank you guys for listening to this. Um, I am concerned about how women are reported in the media. And we do it to ourselves. You can't blame the men on this. Uh, women reporters, uh, women statisticians, all this stuff, play by the numbers. And they all say, well, you know, there were 25 male CEOs at this event or that are leading this charge. There are only two women. Uh, there are 30 new men on corporate boards, but only one woman. And they play the numbers game with us all the time. Back and forth, back and forth. Who's got more on this? Who's got that? I believe that women are doing really well. I don't believe we're losing, and I don't think that women are not contributing, and I think the media is doing us a disservice. So I just say ignore that media noise and play to your natural strengths. Social sensitivity is a kind of literacy, and it turns out that women are naturally more fluent in the language of tone and faces than the other half of their species, which would be men. Uh, women are better at reading the mind, even online when they can't see their teammates' faces. I have a really interesting thing. My youngest son started a mobile app company and actually got to be pretty big, and he actually did sell his company to WPP, but uh, not but my advice, but he did. And I talked to one of his teammates one day, who was a woman, and she said, Gay, you wouldn't believe this. She said, I had to stop Sam in a meeting because he's hard charging, you know, he's real technical. And uh, he's an INTJ on the Myers Briggs, by the way. Uh, and um, so she said, Sam, 
John over there is crying. You really got him upset. He said, oh, really? I didn't even notice that, you know? And here's one of his team members, literally tears rolling down his face. And he said, so I had to stop and deal with it. Okay, I dealt with it, right? But, you know, it's just like little, you think, you know, wouldn't he have noticed that? No, but uh, the, the woman in the room didn't make a big scene out of it, but she kind of made sure that the team felt they could move forward. You can't move forward when you have people crying in the room. You know, that's, that's not a good emotional place to be, unless you're crying for joy that you just got a big promotion or something like that. But, um, so I feel, I feel like women are doing really good. Uh, women are leading some of these teams. They're glue. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't charge out and be, you know, take the next promotion or that next opportunity. But I, I just feel like the media is doing us a disservice and that in innovative societies and in innovative companies, it's coming from teams. No one person has the corner on the truth. And I don't believe in big top-down autocratic uh, management anymore. I mean, I certainly have a structure in my company, but I don't pay attention to our org charts very much. Uh, I really look at what team has just done the latest, coolest thing. And Jill just announced to me uh, across the table as we were getting ready for this that one of our teams just did a knockdown, drag out, fabulous thing for another client, and we're winning a whole bunch uh, more of that business. So it's, it's about these teams that come together, and I watch them, and women are right in the middle of it doing really well. So infuse big thinking and deep discipline in your company. Um, this is something what I, I like to talk about because it's the it's the big thinking, you know. We have a lot of little things we have to do every day, but I find sometimes that those are much easier to check off my list than the bigger stuff. And I need to make sure that each day I've checked off at least one of those big things or a step toward the big thing. I do all my little stuff. Like I'm a hand laundry fanatic. I don't know why. My mother always did her hand laundry. And I travel with my daughter sometimes. And the second we get in our room for the night, I bring out my little soap and I have to wash all my lingerie and stuff right then. And she said, that is just obsessive compulsive. That's ridiculous. I said, no, it's something I checked off my list. I feel really good because I know I'll have clean underwear tomorrow. <laughs> but anyway, it's so stupid. But, uh, but, but anyway. Um, but, so it's the big stuff, and then it has to be a discipline that you don't let these big things get away because they only come around so often. And they create a culture that attracts brains different and better than your own and meet people where they are in their lives. Um, you know, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Put these people together in teams and really pay attention to that because you'll get better thinking with that. Um, the other thing is that I always say, meet people where they are in their lives. This is something my dad taught me. He died when I was 13, but I took away a few good lessons from him. And one of them was that you never know where somebody is. And you look them in the eye and you meet them wherever they are that day. They may be emotionally in a different place. They may be, you know, I've served soup and I was on the Salvation Army board. You don't know where that person came from. And what happened to them that day? You don't know. And then my dad, on the other hand, would say, if you're invited to the White House at a state dinner, you better know how to behave and dress and sit there and say something intelligent. So it's, it's kind of like meeting people wherever they are, paying attention to people, and trying to really get into walking in their shoes a bit. Because you'll be surprised how much you learn from them. And punch above your weight. They always say, I'm little, <laughs> but I always I say, punch above your weight, over deliver every time. You know, and that's been one of the things that we've learned at T3 is that we're kind of the little engine that could, and there we are up on that forester list because we try to punch above our weight. You know, we uh, take on the big hairy stuff sometimes and, and have fun with it because it's exciting to, uh, to take on challenges. And sometimes we fail, but if we don't try and don't take the risk, we'll never know. And then build in resilience and adaptability. Um, you just gotta be resilient. It's, it's all I can say. Th things come at you hard and fast. And um, you know, sometimes life didn't start off great some days. But I find that if you could just get through it and you do have these trusted team members and family members and people that you have invested good will in, you know, that eventually it all comes back. And learn from them, celebrate what you've accomplished. But eyes toward what's next. We stop, we celebrate. And I think that's important. I find that sometimes in our culture we're losing some of our, um, maybe our celebrations, our icons, our, our times that we just stop and say thank you and celebrate things or mourn things. We have to do that. Uh, but then you 
keep your eye on the future because there's something new and exciting that's always coming around the corner. So, last part. I told you I'm still riding horses. That's one of my favorites. His name is Pablo. And the reason his name is Pablo is because he's a paint horse and I named him for Pablo Picasso. And so, but he's a gentle, lovely, wonderful horse. He's a quarter horse. And so I say, at the end of this, with a lot of heart, um, go out and help people. And that's what I was just starting to talk about. All this stuff comes around. And again, I call it buckets and buckets of goodwill. You never know when you have somebody else where it's gonna turn. I cannot tell you how many times these things have come full circle for me. So expect nothing in return, not now. Maybe help an intern get a job. I've done that a lot. You know, if I can help somebody, I always try. Make an introduction. If you know somebody that can help somebody, tell them about it, you know, don't hesitate. And my mom always said, if you like somebody, you should tell them right now. Go tell them, you pick up the phone and you tell them. Uh, and that means even just a coworker. Hey, you know, love has a lot of different meanings. Uh, but I mean, you know, I really like what you did. Uh, or I just absolutely love you in pieces. You were always there for me. And uh, those are the kind of things that we just can't do enough of. You know, it just, it just buys so much peace and happiness for yourself. And take the new employee to lunch. I had a guy who worked for us for many years and he finally retired. He was in his early 60s and decided he wanted to freelance and had enough of the day in, day out corporate world. And so, but his deal was no one told him to do this. But he took every new employee to lunch his entire career at T3. And we all loved him. He was kind of like the cultural icon and the glue of T3 because everyone thought so much of him because he took time to get to know each person when they came into the company. And again, I call it building buckets of goodwill. It will come back. It always comes back some way. And uh, I could tell you one yesterday, it was so amazing. Um, uh, I was on a plane coming here, and on the plane was a very good friend of mine who I know at the University of Texas, and I won't call his name, but uh, he ended up being number two man at all of Chase, uh, just coming from the University of Texas. And um, so through the years, uh, when we got an opportunity to work with Chase, I could always call him, and he wouldn't, he couldn't really call the shots necessarily. I mean, he could have, but you know, he wanted the marketing people to want us and hire us, but he could always help me with the political landmines. And I saw him on the plane yesterday and thanked him so much for that because, you know, that was an 11 year relationship that I knew I had somebody on the inside who could at least, you know, have our back a little bit or at least tell us, you know, what we're getting into, maybe some things we shouldn't work on. So he was a great friend. So. Fierce Conversations, I love that book, by the way. Uh, there's a book I read years ago called Fierce Conversations. It's old as the hills now, but it's a great book if you ever want to read one about how to have some of these tough conversations. How are we on time? Are we good? A few minutes? Okay. Well, I love questions. Anything you want to ask, I will try my best to do it, or if something you want to discuss. This is your group. Yes, back, there's a lady back here. Um, well, um, I was divorced from my first husband, and that was a big failure to me. I mean, I didn't go into a marriage and having a child with uh, the intention of not letting it work. But the thing I learned about him um, was the reason that we really fell apart was that he didn't believe in my career and didn't care about it. Once I got him through dental school and orthodontic school, he expected me to stay home and be a doctor's wife and have children and go to the country club and all that stuff. And I went right back to work after our baby was born. Not right back, but I mean, I, I, I went back to work. And he was not happy about it and made it very clear to me. And so it became a big wedge between us, honestly. I mean, there were other things that happened. I'm not gonna say that was the only thing, but that was the real driver because I knew I had to have my career. I was not meant to just be a stay-at-home mom and I knew it in my heart. So that was a big failure. And I think the Dell thing was a success, but I felt like we really, you know, how did we let that get away from us? I mean, it was so horrible. Um, and I'll never forget the day that I was um, about to speak at Wharton at, to their MBA program. And um, I got a phone call uh, about 10 minutes before I was to step on the stage. And um, I got fired from JCPenney. J we worked with JCPenney for 12 years and they hired a new CEO, CEO 
new marketing team, they fired almost all of our clients. And one of the clients who was leaving gave me the heads up and called me and said, you're gonna lose the business. And it was a big account at the time. And my heart just sank, because we had done everything right for them. And we were making money for them, things were working. And I had to put a smile on my face and walk out on that stage at Wharton and give the speech. But um, those were all tough. And then what happens is when you lose that, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. I mean, you gotta fix it fast. You know, when you got budget cuts, you all know this. I mean, you gotta deal with it. And um, how are you gonna make it work? How do you retain all the great people? How do you keep the culture going? I mean, it's just, those things were, were really tough. I said that after I lost the Dell business, my hair used to be dark brown and it went white the next day. And uh, so I've dyed it kind of blonde ever since. You know, cover it up. Anyway, another one? Yes? Hi, I'm Maureen Stefanini. Hi. So who has had a huge influence on your work? Why and how? Okay. Uh, I think more uh, of what has had an influence on our work has been the technology that we we chase after and try to prototype. Um, you know, we love wonderful creative work. I mean, no, no one can say that I don't like emotional, beautiful, you know, heartwarming, whatever creative. But I really think what drives us is the tenacity and curiosity for what's next. And it's really the consumer that drives us. So if the consumer is looking at something on their wrist and that's where they're getting their information and they're talking to that, well, we better figure that out. If a consumer is on Facebook back in the day, well, we had to figure that out. If a consumer is, you know, looking at options and what the competitive landscape, we better know why. So it's getting in the head of the consumer and that drives our work more than anything. Yeah. You were going to say something You're making something really cool artist. there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, I didn't tell you that. Yeah, well, so tell us your artist story. Okay, real quick, artist story. So when I was at the University of Texas, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Studio Art. And if anybody's been an art major, you'll know that that's the hardcore art path. I mean, it's pure uh, art. I did do a little bit of commercial uh, drawings and stuff at the time, and that's how I got in the ad business. But uh, I was training to be an artist, and I realized, uh, and like I said, my father died when I was 13, and my mother was not very good with finances, so I had to go out and get a job immediately. So I went to work in the ad business. So I put aside all the art stuff, way back here in my memory, had a family. I did have three children, because uh, my second husband had two, and I had Rebecca, so we had three. I raised three from the time they were little tiny kids, two, three, and five. Um, but I never could be an artist. And so about almost four years ago now, I decided one day, I'm going to go out to our ranch, and I'm just going to grab some canvases and paint brushes and paint, and just see what happens. And so I did, and I was messing around with all kinds of stuff, everything very abstract, and I had to prove that I still had the hand skills, and I could draw, and I could do this, so I did some very realistic drawings. And my husband laughed and walked around and said, you know, I'm so glad you're enjoying this, but you're never gonna make a dime off this art stuff. And I said, well, I don't care, I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. Well, I won't tell the whole story, but this is about connections and how the world goes around. It, it started literally in Egypt, a connection I have, and it went all the way back to New York and around, and it, long story. I ended up with a one-woman art show at a gallery in Chelsea last April for a month, and I sold 24 paintings at the gallery. I've sold, um, since then, six more on my own, and then I had another show in Chelsea with five artists that just went down about two weeks ago, and I sold three more paintings there and I'm having another small show in Austin in May, so I'm an artist now. And, uh, <laughs> yay, uh, and I'm really an artist. I had to like pinch myself. When the woman who owns the gallery, who actually is Ann Moore, who was the former CEO and chairman of Time, Inc., and she's done this gallery thing as act two in her life. And so I'd kind of known her, but we weren't friends, and so that's who gave me this opportunity, and I'm always grateful for that. But I had to walk out of the gallery the day that she said, I'm going to do your show, and this is the dates I can do it. And I was walking out, and I was kind of skipping along like that girl, you know, like this is my day. <laughs> and I had to kind of pinch myself, literally. And I said, you are an artist. Gay, you are an artist. And I got to say it for the first time in my life, and it just meant the world to me. So it's been fun, and I love doing it. So anyway, way, way back there in the Uh, the, th the biggest threats we have is when there's a new CMO uh, in town, 
or a change like JCPenney did, where not only did they change CMO, they had a top-down CEO all the way down change. And when that happens, uh, fortunately for us, we've been able to weather those storms a lot. But in the worst case scenario, we don't, uh, because sometimes new people want to bring in their own teams. Uh, but you know, we've really been fortunate through the years to weather a bunch of those storms. And we stayed at Dell, like I said, 16 years until that happened. And we went, they had eight different agencies during that time. And we hung in there through it all. But that's the threat, you know, because usually it's not that we're not doing good work. That's not the problem. Uh, it's just literally personnel changes that can be threatening. So that's the honest truth. Did you have a question? Okay. Someone who's moving into a leadership role, okay. Uh, I would really, really get to, first of all, when I said be competent, uh, obviously if you have done this or you're doing this, someone has already seen that. And so you've shown that you uh, want to be a leader and that you have skills. So I would learn everything about it I could. I would just double down on the homework. I mean, learn everything about the job, everything that has to do, and then really look for people, like I said, who can support you in your role. They'll let you do what you do best. Um, find, if you're not good at certain things, well, don't try to do it. I mean, you've got to find those other folks, you know, who are on the hub, you're up the, the leader, in the, and then I always find all these people who do things better than me. Um, and acknowledge them and praise them and let them take the credit. Um, one of my favorite football players ever was Earl Campbell, who played for the University of Texas back when I was there in the 1970s. And Earl was notorious. He was one of the best running backs in the history of football. Uh, won the Heisman Trophy, and I'll never forget the night he won that. We were all so excited for him. But his line was always, it's my teammates, and he never took credit even though it was so obvious sometimes that he was pulling like five players down the field with them to make that touchdown. But he said, no, I could never have done that without my offensive tackles and with everybody else on this team. So I say give credit back to everybody else and be humble in what you do, but be decisive, you know? So that's my advice. Way back, way back. This will be the last question. I'm sorry, I could stay here forever. In fact, I'll stay here a few minutes if anyone wants just to hang around and talk. But um, I know you have to go back to work and you have other things to do. But, uh, there are other things going on today, right? Uh, uh, when things weren't on, were on track, uh, what kept you motivated and preventing you from returning to a typical 9 to 5? Uh, what motivated me? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. When things weren't on track, what kept you motivated to return into a typical 9 to 5? To keep going and working my butt off? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? It really came to a point that I, I have to say that my father dying when I was 13 was a big motivator to me about making money and making sure I, was, I tried to do that because I always felt responsible for my family and, uh, you know, making sure that we had what we needed. So that would motivate me. And then there was a point that the huge motivational factor was everybody who worked for me. And when I walk into T3 every day and see these amazing, smart people who have chosen to spend their career with me, uh, or at least a point in their career, I'm so motivated by that, and I want to make sure I continue to do a good job or make it a great place to work so that I don't let them down. You know, and it's like they've trusted me and I need to give it back to them. So it's a, it's a personal motivation to be successful and, you know, I think when you do something, you need to make money. Oh, and by the way, one last thing. I did make money on my art. And when my husband said, you're not going to make a dime on it, um, I called him when my first check came through. I was standing in the gallery and I said, Lee, I've got a check here that's for... Uh, $17,483.92. Is that more than a dime? I think so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>